Well, it's a great pleasure to be here. I, I, um, I come before you not as a great evangelist, but that's far from it, but a person who believes in evangelism and communicating the faith. I'm a, an Anglican minister and a, I mean a, an evangelist and a teacher. And this is really where the rubber hits the road for me about the theological issues and scriptural issues. How do we communicate what Christ does and, and what Christ offers, the consequences of receiving and re or rejecting it? Um, this is the, the, the real uh, pointy end of it. This is where it all comes down. So um, I offer these thoughts to you today to stimulate your thinking, and, but I don't, I'm not the expert with all the answers on this matter. Um, so let me just launch into this. I want to just read to you uh, kindly from this lovely annotated Bible I've been given um, from first uh, epistle of St. John. Uh, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life. For the word life was manifested, and we have seen it, and bear witness, and show unto you that eternal life, which was with the Father, and was manifested unto us. That which we have seen and heard, declare we unto you, that ye also may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father, and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And these things write we unto you, that your joy may be full. Familiar words from that great opening um, part of the letter. So thank you for your Bible. <laughs> I may actually need it again. <laughs> I'll quote from memory. The Christian gospel is the word of life. The word of life, the message of life. But sometimes it actually isn't heard that way and isn't proclaimed that way. So uh, what's gone wrong? What, uh, what can we, uh, how can we work this out? Um, there'll be a fuller edition of this uh, talk uh, in a written article form which you can have and which will I think maybe perhaps be published but don't worry if you don't get down all the details and I did uh, have an outline I don't know whether you've got an outline of this talk he's got an outline that's good there we are there we are so that's so I'll try to stick a little bit to the outline while that's being handed out um, let me just say first of all that as I, as I indicated that um, there are some doctrines in my view that are secondary matters. I know people argue about whether doctrines are secondary matters. Some, some people's secondary doctrines are actually major for them. But in my tradition, there are ma major and secondary doctrines. Um, but it hit me uh, with great force years ago that, of course, the doctrine of hell or final judgment is not a minor matter. It's actually a gospel issue because it deals with what Christ offers and the consequences of receiving or rejecting it. So. The first thing to say, unlike some issues in my doctrinal tradition of the Anglican Church, which we may argue about, uh, we may choose to disagree with about, about um, the extent of certain things, um, this one is, is central and, and major. Uh, and I have a sort of biographical um, interest in it. Um, just to, to explain a little bit about myself, I know Greg's introduced me. I've been ordained over 30 years. I've served as a pastor or senior rector, senior pastor of a number of parishes in different parts of Australia. And I've worked now for five years uh, in church development work in, in the central office of my denomination in Queensland. I'm from the evangelical tradition, conservative evangelical, working uh, now, as I've worked for 24 years, in a mainly liberal part of the church. So I'm sort of in a different situation. So I've had different reactions to my views on hell and even to coming to this conference. My conservative evangelical friends look at me very strangely and I get very uneasy, as I always have, about my views on hell. And the liberal Anglicans go, what? You're going to a conference about what? And then they laugh, so there we are. That's good. Just some definitions um, to make sure we're on the same page. Evangelism is, I, I take it, the activity of communicating the good news that God has accomplished our salvation for us through Christ in order to bring us into a right relationship with him and eventually to destroy all the results of sin in the world. That's a definition which I like. There's many definitions. I take it that gospeling or evangelism can take many forms as there are many motivational entry points for conveying the good news. Surely there is a core of biblical truths that need to be conveyed about God the Creator, about the problem of sin, about Christ and his incarnation, substitution, and the renewing of creation, and about our response to God. All those things will come up in the process of communicating the Christian faith. So the basic biblical storyline of creation, fall, redemption, and renewal would surely be uh, the truth framework for our evangelism. Um, but that's what I understand by evangelism, communicating the Christian faith, essentially addressing the basic question of what is offered in the good news of Jesus Christ and what difference does it make if it, you believe it or reject it. 
Um, also, I won't go into this at, at length, but uh, I think we've heard a lot about traditionalism. Um, the view that uh, the consequences of rejecting Christ or losing Christ, if you like, or losing salvation is a punitive separation from God and God's blessings in an ongoing existence that is uh, miserable or painful or unpleasant, or however you want to defi define it. Uh, conditional immortality um, essentially is the view that God's final judgment uh, is the withdrawal of life. And on the positive side, that life is really ultimately found only in God's gift, conditionally given in this age, but needing to be confirmed through union with Christ in the new age of eternity. Or as one 19th century writer put it, no existence is possible for being absolutely cut off from God in whom all things consist. So conditional immortality says that life is with God. Uh, a gift now, and it will be a gift forever, but on God's terms and in relationship with God. Um, now, divine judgment or accountability for human life is consistent with this view um, and uh, is part of it. Um, conditionalist evangelism is, um, I don't mean that evangelism is conditional, <laughs> um, but is evangelism shaped by conditional immortality um, positions and approaches. So this has been a great um, exercise for me to think about, again, how I would go about evangelism um, and how I do go about evangelism. I haven't thought about this in such a way for many years, so I, I welcome the opportunity. I recognize there is a range of views amongst people who hold this conditionalist approach, a range of views about atonement, and I'm not suggesting there's only one way of, of um, doing it. But let me make, um, make some... Um, uh, applications of it. And I've got five distinctive applications that I think are distinctive contributions of a conditionalist or conditional immortal mortalism approach to evangelism. There may be others. These are the five that have, that have come up for me. And the first one is that, um, that uh, the conditionalist, the conditional evangelist, conditionalist evangelist is able to give or should be able to give a full and confident proclamation of the gospel. Um, now, uh, one, of the, one of the problems with the traditional doctrine of hell, in my view, is that uh, it actually, in the circles I've moved in for a good part of my Christian life and my ministry, uh, I found that people who believe in it actually avoid talking about it. Now, in your part of the church, it may be different. But uh, my, my background is, this is where my journey started on the matter, that from the beginning of my Christian life, from my commitment to Christ conscious when I was 17, I'm now 61, and I've been with evangelical churches most of that time, uh, most of the Christians I've fellowship with and worked with have been believers in uh, the traditional view of hell. But it rarely shows up in any, in any um, teaching from the pulpit or any consistent uh, instruction. It is rarely mentioned at all, even by people who fervently believe it. Uh, it is actually uh, not clearly stated in gospel presentations. When I wrote my article years ago, I, as an exercise, collected, got my collection of gospel presentations, tracts and things that I'd collected that the people in my sort of evangelical Anglicanism used, and studied them. And they were actually essentially uh, using code language about what they believed. The, 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 the consequences of rejecting Christ were never spelt out. The, some of the words were biblical words like death or separation from God, but not spelt out uh, indeed. In fact, it would be a very interesting research topic to find out what the hearers of our gospel presentations actually thought we were saying about the consequences of rejecting Christ and not turning to Christ. It, probably, it would probably be very salutary to find out. Um, and this struck me as very, very strange. So I, I take it that um, people of my background have had a bad conscience about hell, know that it's actually an offensive doctrine, the traditional doctrine of hell, are embarrassed about it, and so consequently, don't actually spell it out, even to uh, when they're um, talking to the unbelievers, which is astonishing, really. Because it's at this point of evangelism, you really want to point out what the benefits of Christ are, following Christ, and what the consequences of not responding would be. So I, I, this is my point of coming in personally on the matter. And I recognize that was the case for me as a, a, a preacher and evangelist, that I wasn't clear about it. I tried for a while to beef up my, my um, commitment to the traditional view and tried to think about how to preach it. But ultimately, um, uh, I, uh, I couldn't really feel good about that and eventually went on a journey of changing and Mr. Fudge's book was the uh, help I needed. Ironically, 
when people do are pressed about it, when evangelicals, in my experience, are pressed about their views on it to, with fellow believers, then they will come out quite strongly about it and, and, and trot out all the uh, fairly heavy-handed approach towards people like myself and tell me all the reasons why I'm not wrong, I'm wrong, I'm, I'm, the scripture teaches this, and then give all these speculative justifications of it. But the, the, the explanations they've assailed me with, and which I've rehearsed myself years ago, they will rarely, if ever, share with the, with the lost person. Has this been your experience? Certainly been mine, and in Australia. So I think um, it's a real impediment to uh, communicating the gospel. Um, Whereas conditional, conditionalists have actually got a, a very, um, as it were, a straightforward message to proclaim. It may not be believed by everybody, of course, um, but we have a straightforward offer of life, life in Christ alone, as I hope I'll show you through uh, the next points I'm making. A, a reasonable explanation of divine judgment, even if people don't under, understand it or appreciate it. What we can say is, God gives you life. And we are accountable to God, whether we like it or not, for the life we live. And he wants us to know him. He wants us to respond to his love for us. And that's where true life and fulfillment is found. If people choose not to, then ultimately that, that gift is withdrawn. And we face God and the consequences of how we've lived and the life is withdrawn. Now, people might not agree with that, but it's got a certain reasonableness about it. A gift is given and graciously given to, with the space for us to use it as we, as we wish, as it were, and make in our freedom some terrible mistakes. Uh, but ultimately, have to render accounts for our lives to God, and then um, if we reject the, the gift of ongoing eternal life, it is withdrawn. Um, we don't have to um, come up with um, weird uh, uh, rationalizations for why God does what God might be uh, going to do. We take the statement of St. Paul in its full strength that the wages of sin is death. Um, and that God is very reasonable in his view that he does not want and cannot allow people to go on rejecting and living disconnected for, from him forever. As you know, the great statement of Genesis 3, that people cannot take the tree of life in sin and rebellion and live forever, separated from God. Um, so... Um, that's, that is, I think, the, uh, the, the reason why. So I found when I started uh, communicating the gospel yeah, from a conditionalist point of view in my evangelism, I would actually tell them this. I, would actually, I, didn't, I had no reservation now telling, telling people about their accountability to God, the gift that God gives of their life, and that gift will not last forever, and then it comes back. Now, whether that moves people to repentance or not, at least we can say, this is what judgments involve, um, and so on. So a, a full and confident gospel presentation, proclamation, I think, is what we can do. It doesn't solve all the problems because there's some issues we need to think about. Um, okay. Now, the, um, the second distinctive that I want to mention today, and I know some of these things I, I feel are a little bit saying the obvious, but uh, anyway, this is what I came up with. <laughs> um, we will remove people, people's false hope of immortality. I can't speak for your context. Many of you, of course, are here from the United States and other places, I imagine. Um, but I know in Australia there is a kind of, there are a lot of people who have a kind of, you live this life and you're dead and that's uh, all over. But in Australia there is a, a kind of general idea of immortality around. It surfaces sometimes at funerals and in times like that. Um, a Christless immortality that has nothing to do with, with relationship with God. Uh, it's certainly around. And, of course, there are... Um, there are people who've put forward a kind of theology of it. But con conditional conditionalist evangelism removes that false hope. It, it forces a choice. It says that life is found in, in, with God and from God. And um, beyond this life, it is still in connection and union with the giver of life that life can go on. Um, and it will be uh, a choice that we need to make to live in submission to God and love to God through the grace of his son or choose um, another way. So um, I do believe that um, the condition of mortality actually forces people up with a, a bit of a shock. And in the times that I've, in times that I've shared this gospel message with people, it has actually, you can see the reaction. Because I think in the back of people's minds, there is a kind of hope, well, maybe I'll just, you know, go off to be somewhere else with my loved ones and 
whatever. And, and it's a bit of a shock to them to tell them that, they are, that God will withdraw the gift of life. Absolutely. It's a kind of a, it, it, is, it is actually a kind of shocking sort of message uh, at that point um, to be told. Um, uh, what was I going to say here? Yeah. So, um, so we're, tell, we're, tell, we're telling people we're telling people that it won't be an easy um, dissolution after death. So I'm sorry, I've got myself clear now where I am. Um, we remove this idea that um, people just go on. Now, an objection comes to mind here, um, or is often raised, does this weaken our evangelism? You know, Does the fact that, um, that um, we don't believe in traditional hell weaken our evangelism, our motivation? You know? In fact, are we not saying to people, oh, well, it'll just be like euthanasia? You know, have fun while you're alive and then it's all over and, and you know, uh, okay, is that all that I'm, is that nothing to be frightened of? You know, some people might say, I don't mind, I have my go and then I die. Now, I had an occasion in my early days of sharing the gospel where this reaction came over. I was sitting in the lounge room with the family, it was the couple, the couple rather, the man and the woman, and the man said to me, well, that's okay then. Eat, drink and be merry. I don't mind. God takes my existence away. Um... And, and uh, I said to him then, which I, I'm going to be expounding to you, that uh, I, I, I accept that, that is, that's a choice people make. But what I said to him then is what I think we should say is, you really do not know what it means to lose God. And one of the contributors to the Rethinking Hell volume talks about the infinite loss of God. And I think it's a challenge to us as evangelists to go back to a positive explanation of what it means to know God. All right? And that's where I think conditionalist evangelism really moves us, not to threats of ongoing punishment to make people take it seriously, but the, the inducement of the wonderful grace of God and what it means to know God. I'll come back to that at the end because I'm going to give you a little bit of an, uh, a presentation of the gospel uh, from the conditionalist view. Um, so, we are not um, talking about the avoidance of accountability with God. I don't think myself that conditional immortality necessarily believes it's just going to be, you know, annihilation and just go. Uh, there will be an encounter with God. Um, I don't like the term annihilationism for that reason of thinking people it gives the wrong kind of idea. There will be a final and awesome encounter with God and an accountability and judgment about how we lived our lives. I don't think we should think that would be easy or necessarily pleasant, totally, but um, it is for the teaching of the Bible. The real loss, as I say, is the awareness that people have lost God and all that there is in it. Um, that's a, a penalty in itself. But we, what we offer is a, an offer of real life, an invitation to enter into a deeper fulfilment with God and on God's terms. Um, one of the French conditionalists of the 19th century, Mr. Petterville, he said, wandering from the source of life, the sinner takes his slow funereal way towards eternal death. There's a sense in which we are saying to people, and unless they deal with their, 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 their disconnection from God, it will kill them eventually. And there's a tremendous loss in that. Um, so the conditionless gospel will confront people with this sobering challenge about life and ultimate destiny. It won't affront our sense of justice. It has a kind of fairness and reasonable to it, reasonableness to it. Um, what it says essentially is life depends on union with God. Um, as Petterville says, life, life is a sacred trust which God withdraws from those who abuse it. And I like this phrase, this sentence. The creator forces no one to remain seated at the banquet of life. It's a good start, a good line. Ultimately, God gives us a conditional enjoyment of life, whether we acknowledge God or not. But finally, uh, it cannot be done on our terms forever. Um, to lose God is an infinite loss. And one of the writers, I think Christopher Marshall, in the book We Thinking Hell, he says, what greater punishment can there be or loss can there be than to lose God? You don't need to sort of, you know, spice it up, as it were, and warm it up with extra tortures going on forever, you know? I mean, in one sense, I think uh, that traditional doctrine kind of betrays a lack of confidence in the glory and wonder of the grace of God. We have to motivate people by threatening them uh, with this extrinsic, consequence of some ongoing punishment 
the, the penalty of the loss of loss of God is uh, should be sufficient to mo motivate it in itself. So there it is. Now there is the issue of Christian universalism, um, the hope that there will be a post mortem salvation, and there's some hope outside of it. This is very common in my my church where I work, where most of my fellow clergy would have this view, um, and uh, the result of it, of course, is that people lose all interest in evangelism. People are going to be saved in some way. So you don't really need to bring them to faith in Christ. And this does wonders for church growth, by the way. <laughs> Not. <laughs> Anglicans in my part of the world are realizing that if you actually aren't interested in evangelism, sooner or later the church starts to die. Um, uh, they think that what motivates us, and I was just put to me at the highest point in a public meeting, it's, it's, it's you believe, Ralph, that unless, he said, and you and your friends, conservative evangelicals, believe that your motivation for evangelism is that people, unless they believe in Christ, will burn in hell forever. But we don't believe in that, so we don't have a motivation to do it. But you have that motivation. To which I said, no, I don't have that motivation. Knowing Christ now and forever is a positive blessing that's worth telling people about. Is that not true? And, I, you know, and so uh, people of the liberal persuasion don't understand it. So I'm not talking, I don't want to talk about universalism, except I believe that the idea of it will uh, essentially cut the nerve of evangelism and remo remove the urgency in people's minds to respond. They will say, oh, well, uh, see what happens after I die, you know, kind of thing. A third distinctive is um, uh, implicit of what I've said. The Christian gospel is framed as the offer of life, abundant life, now and forever with God. It is framed very much as good news. You know, I've come, Jesus said in John 10, verse 10, I've come to offer them life and life abundantly. Um, now, we've had some discussion already in this conference about what really is at issue when we talk about conditional immortality. Um, essentially, what I believe which a life is about, and this is my equation for it. I've got a little equation. Life is physical existence from God, of course, plus knowing God and enjoying the blessings of God. That seems to me what life in the full sense in the Bible is. So when the gospel, St. John tells us the gospel is the word of life, it's life with a capital L. True life is knowing God. Uh, we share the same physical life as people unbelievers do, but we have, uh, beyond the physical life from God, we have an ex a life with God, a blessing of knowing God, which I'll come back, uh, come back to. And that's what Jesus Christ offers, to overcome the breach of relationship between humans and God, to uh, help us to deal with our own sin, both the guilt of it and, and the corrupting effects of it, um, so that we might indeed um, not be destroyed by our own sort of self-oriented anti-God tendencies, but come back to God. So the, I think conditionalist evangelists, the conditional evangelists will frame the problem of sin, first of all, in relational and personal terms with sin as a self-destructive power, which will ultimately destroy us. I know we can think of it in a kind of moralistic way, a, a judicial way, uh, I understand that, and there's certainly that's an aspect of it, but I do think there is a danger of framing our gospel, our view of sin, in a moralistic framework. I think it's much, much better to see it as the break of relationship with God. In other words, to think about sin with a capital S, breach with God, rather than focusing on little, little s sins the manifestations of it. Uh, the real problem is the broken relationship with God. Um, I think our contemporary Western world may not respond to an invitation to debate ethical and moral scales of value when we talk about sins, but they may be on our wavelength when we draw attention to the widespread experiences of futility and self-destruction in human life and point out that that is what we're talking about and ultimately that is what comes from the breach with God. The late John Wenham said, he found that approaching the issue of sin and judgment this way had power in evangelism. He said, in personal talks, I often find myself explaining the self-destructive power of sin and its ultimate power to destroy absolutely. I explain that that is how God has made the world. Judgment expresses his wrath and the abominable thing which he hates. In other words, God hates the fact that we are destroying ourselves. He's on the side of life. And if he adopts a uh, a, a, sort of a strong approach to the sins of the human race is because he loves us and these things actually kill us, whether we realize it or not. Um, now, we have, the we have the responsibility and challenge to explain how 
Christ offers abundant life and what this life means, how Christ rescues us from sin and lifts us into the fellowship of life. And this is where we come to, as it were, the idea of the atonement. And I can't deal with this in great depth today because it's not a subject on, topic on the atonement. But um, the good news, whatever view of the atonement we have, is that God in Christ has acted dramatically and decisively to enable people to come back, back to relationship with God, to find forgiveness of sin. I know that the penal substitutionary theory of the atonement is very dominant in the reformational and evangelical tradition. And that's what I was taught in, and that's what I've held for most of my ministerial career. I think that an objection to conditional immortality can arise from this view of the atonement, which I think we've heard talked about already in the conference, um, that uh, if the main work of Christ was to bear the punishment for our sins, and if it was an infinite punishment for guilt, then it took, um, it took the Son of God to do that, the penalty on the cross. Um, so people uh, then raise questions about our view. How can... Um, how can uh, the conditional immortality view of judgment um, deal with the problem of sins? Uh, I, I, I just want to make a comment here. Um, I think the traditional understanding of infinite punishment in hell is reinforced by appealing to the view that there's some strict equivalence in punishment between the penalty incurred by human sins and the infinitely powerful atoning suffering of the God-man, Christ, on the cross. So you end up with a kind of strange reaction or discussion, a mathematical kind of theology where we start saying, does this conditional immortality view of ceasing to exist in, in, in the judgment of God, and how does that deal with the, the, the kind of infinite cost of the, our salvation? Uh, I think that takes you off into a calculus of sins and punishment that seems to me to leave behind um, the specific text of Scripture. The conditionalist evangelist will see the atoning work of Christ as our substitute and representative, as uh, the key to new life. Uh, I do see that um, I believe that Christ is our substitute and our representative, and that we are in him, and he and humanity rises in him and is changed in him. So the real problem of, of, of sin, or uh, which is the real consequence of hell, is indeed what Christ has come to deal with. And if I said to you before that... that um, that life, as I see it, is physical existence in this life with the blessing and approval of God, then in one sense, what Christ endured for us was indeed the withdrawal of that gift. He died. And a sense of God-forsakenness in that mystery, I believe. A sense that, as it were, he entered into the position of those rejected and has rejected God. This is the mystery of the cross. Um, the judgment on sin was the loss of God's presence and blessings. Uh, and I think that that's what Christ was bearing, if you like, um, in, in the cross. There's a lot more to my view of the cross and what Jesus did for us of a, of a, upon the positive side. But now is not the time to expand it. I'm thinking in the article, if it gets published, I will explain that. Um, so death is the opposite of life, the loss of God's fellowship and blessings and the loss of e existence. But we are, we are saying to people that God is offering life, abundant life, now and forever with God. That's what Christ comes to do and to offer. And he's done whatever it can to whatever he has been able to do to uh, remove what would stop people from having that life. Um, fourthly, can I mention fourthly, that, um, that uh, one of the distinctives of conditionalism when you apply it to evangelism is the resurrection comes right to the fore of the gospel message. I think that, for me, this is really good news. This, this is a very important thing. As an evangelical, I've been, like most evangelicals, crucicentric, cruci you know, cross-centered. And that's fine, because the cross is in the work of God. It's not to be marginalized. But you will know that one of the distinctives of... Um, evangelical theology has been to make the cross so central that the resurrection becomes a kind of corollary or a, a kind of consequence of it. I see a few people nodding. And this is a theological issue. Whereas, um, whereas if, you, um, if you approach it from the conditional, conditionalist point of view, you'll see that the saving life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ is all part of his saving work. And, um, and, uh, and the, the resurrection, indeed, as it were, is a kind of... Um, uh, demonstration and victory of, of Christ over the, uh, the consequence of sin. Uh, he comes as the new Adam to 
who re recap recapitulates the whole plight of humanity and through his obedience all the way to the cross removes the sin problem. And then in the resurrection, um, he, as it were, brings up out of death humanity in himself, the new head of the humanity and so on. It's interesting that when the glorious Christ of the, resurrect of the revelation to John announces himself to the seer in chapter 1, it is his victory over death that is his great achievement, he mentions in Revelation 1, 17 to 18. It's a victory over death, the consequence of sin. That is the great victory. He has freed us from our sins by his blood. He holds the keys of death and Hades in his risen power. Um, um, so in other words, I think in our, in our evangelism, we will want to major on the resurrection. We want to say, let me tell you what Christ offers. He can bring you out of the grave. Back to this world as well as the future world. You know, um, part of my job as a pastor has been to be with people in grief situations so many times, sometimes with little children dying. It's the saddest, heartbreaking thing. And I realised I had nothing I could say to them and have nothing to say to them to alleviate the pain other than this. And this is, I will actually say these words. The only thing I can say to you is that Jesus Christ can raise your child from the grave because he's done it before with Christ. Really raised. And th at this point, we need to be really clear. We're not talking to our contemporaries, our unbelieving contemporaries, about immortality. We need to tell them we're talking about real return to life, tangible, real return to life. Glorified, yes, in God's new world, yes, but real and, uh, and real indeed. Um, so that's what I think um, the conditionalist approach does because this is this made of a part of a piece with our gospel. Because if the wages of sin is death, the victory of God for us will be the victory over death. That's where sin is, is unrolled back and all that sin does in killing and destroying. Um, so I, I do believe that's a, a major part of our, um, our, our message. Um, one writer puts it, um, Christ actualized the full surrender to God that we could that we could will but not actualize. And in his resurrection, to go on and quote, dying and rising with Christ means that believers identify with his representative death and resurrection and it facilitates a change of lordship as the believer dies to the dominion of sin and death and enters new life in the, in the realm of Christ. So in sharing the gospel message, we will invite people to leave the realm of sin and death and to come under the lordship of Christ and through union with him to share in his resurrection life, now and forever. Uh, my experience in pastoral ministry is that you see in me a lot of people who know they're living, their life is failing, and that sin is actually, they wouldn't call it that, but they, their life's a mess. So we, we should say to them, come out from this into the realm of Christ, who, who can deal with your failures and release you from this cycle of sin and death and give you new life. Um, and essentially what we're saying is we're inviting people to become God's, part of God's renewal of creation because that's what the resurrection's about. The cross and the resurrection, the gospel, is how Jesus Christ is renewing the world. Renewing human lives, renewing the world. Uh, we won't offer people a spiritual escape from moral failure, but an engagement in the real world which God is going to renew. And um, the, the resurrection of Christ portends and promises our own coming resurrection. And there will be no other way to enter the new age of God other than in union with the Lord Jesus Christ. We need to be really clear about that. So I, that, I do believe that this is quite um, uh, important distinctive. And it leads me to my fifth and final one, that the Christian good news, I think, for, on a conditional basis, will be presented as the renewal of creation. Uh, I think this is a very important. I think conditionalist evangelism fits well with a biblical theological gospel presentation which highlights the movement from creation, fall, the plan of redemption, if you like, long plan of redemption, and the, then the victory of God over sin and the renewal of creation. Um, a narrative approach of evangelism. The work of God in Christ is to renew the cosmos as, as the source of life in the new creation, Ephesians 1. And the individual's response to Christ is actually being placed in this wider story of God's renewal of the world. Uh, I had a conversation with my son uh, some months ago. He, he made a very interesting point. He, he said to me that evangelism in previous ages, gospel 
constructs, gospel ways of understanding the gospel in previous ages have made sense in con contexts. You know, in feudal culture, maybe, you know, there were ideas of present, presenting the work of Christ that made sense. And maybe in, in, uh, in law-based and uh, previous uh, cultures, previous times, um, the sense of God's law and doing the right thing and failing and Christ bearing the punishment for you made, made a lot more sense. I suspect today that the work of Christ um, on the cross may, um, may have more traction if we put it in its larger biblical and theological narrative of the renewal of the world because people are very concerned about what's been hap happening to the whole cosmos, the whole world, about life as we're a part of. I'll just give this to you uh, as an idea. Um, Tim Keller observes that we can offer the biblical good news of how an individual can get right with God and we can also offer the biblical good news of what God will fully accomplish in history through the salvation of Jesus. He says, this is to understand the question of what hope is there for the world. Um, so ecological issues, if you like, may actually open the door. Um, so life in Christ is a world-renewing plan of God. And will people accept God's powerful offer of new life to become part of the new creation? Because surely that's what the Bible's about, creation to new creation. If any man is in Christ, if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. That could be our opening gambit. Do you want to join the new creation of God? Because it's already started in Christ. And sin has been dealt with. And uh, death is rolled back already. Would you like to join this? Um, uh, also, um, I want to just add a point here that... Um, uh, the gospel is presented in conditionalist terms, can be presented as a solution to the problem of evil, as I've said. The good news can be framed as the victory of Christ over sin, evil and death, as the ultimate victory of God over the, for the renewal of creation. I'm doing a series on Romans chapter 8 at a church in Brisbane. I come every month and I do another one. And uh, I was a guest preacher in this new church plant. And I, I, I've been saying to them that the 8th chapter of Romans, which is a sort of recapitulation of the gospel, I think Paul's great statement of it again, uh, in one sense can be looked on as, a, as you can break it open and look on it as St. Paul's exposition of the good news as God's answer to the problem of evil. Now the problem of evil is the big thing that's thrown up against us, at least in Australia. It's the biggest objection to God. What if instead of being the biggest objection to God and the, God, and the truth of the gospel is actually the answer the gospel is addressing? So I've taken in my evangelistic uh, presentations to, to address it head on. Would you like to know how God is dealing with evil? It may, and it may, and I say to people, it may not be that you will agree with how God's done it. I wouldn't have invented this way of doing it. We, we would have never thought that God himself, actually God himself would come down into the mess of the world and bear the pain of it. That's a surprise. No one was saw, saw that coming. But that's what God's done. And as you know, Romans 8 goes from the work of Christ all the way to the renewal of creation. Um, so I said to the people at the church a few weeks ago, if you're having trouble explaining the Christian gospel, just get Romans 8 out, because there it is, the whole story, and tell them it's about the renewal of the world and the healing of pain and evil and removal of that from the, from the world. Um, must move on. Um, I think we will also... Uh, Fourthly, I just want to mention my last point in this section. We want to keep the work of God closely related to the call of obedience and the renewal by the Holy Spirit. Um, if we're going to say that the gospel is about renewing creation, renewing people's lives, I think we should say what life in Christ involves. Now, I'm, I'm, I, my, my evangelical background wanted to keep sanctification and the work of the Holy Spirit sort of like sealed off from gospel presentations, lest we confuse people about what God does for them and what they've got to do or their own thing. I think that's a bit of a mistake. It's to artificially divide the work of Christ and the work of the Spirit. We should tell them what difference it will make to live the new life, what God has done for them and what God will do in them in order to effect this thorough renewal. And I just mention that because I think that is, um, if we're going to take the point of life, that uh, is important uh, to follow it up. Now, I know we've got to... 45 minutes, but can, if you, to bear with me, I want to just take you through a very quick outline of the gospel. I nearly chickened out on this. I thought I'm going to face all these great evangelists here in Houston, and they'll all go, oh, my goodness, what a pathetic gospel outline. But um, um, So I've shared my inadequacies with you here. Um, but actually, working on this again really was a little aha moment for me. 
Because it seemed to me when you approach it from the point of view I've been outlining, it really turns it all around in a, in a, in a way. But anyway, I'll give it to you to show you and I'll just run through it on this slide. Uh, I can never do this. I'm sort of pretending to be giving an evangelistic presentation. but I've got no sense of dra dramatic in me. Um, what does life offer? And what is the good life or the best life? That could be the way. I mean, there are many entry points. Essentially, we're talking to people about living. Are we not? What life's involved? What's the best life? How to get the most, or where, where is the fullest potential out of life? That's just one gambit in. We could have used the one I just mentioned. You know, would you be interested in knowing how God is creating, the, you know, re renewing the world or what God's doing about the mess of the world? Anyway, what's, the, what's life offer? What is the good life, the best life? The Christian message is that life in, in its fullness, is lived in its fullness, is found in knowing God. This God who has reached out to bring us back to himself through Jesus Christ. That is the Christian message. That God actually wants to bless us and wants it, us to know him and wants us to find abundant life in him. Um, so let's understand what life is offered to you in Christ. Um, the first thing that's offered in the gospel, of course, is being connected in relationship with God, who's the God of the universe, who loves you and wants to bless you. That's what we're offering in Christ, on, on grace. That's what Christ offers in the gospel, isn't it? That's what we want to tell people about. But that's, that's what we're calling them to do, to be blessed, you know? Uh, and one of my evangelistic encounters some years ago, this man was getting very, he thought it was a negative thing. I was talking to him about it. I said, hey, listen, this is the best message in the world. You don't, you don't have to believe it, but I'm not embarrassed about it because God wants to kind of bless you out of your socks. Right? Now, you may not want it, but it's good. It's good to be raised to life after your death through the resurrection power of Christ. Does that interest you? To be actually raised a whole new life with God after your death. To be healed progressively of the disease of sin that's behind all the other problems that we all have, the self-destructive behaviour of self. God wants to heal us. And of course, people may not recognise they want to be healed, but that's, that's another subject. And to be forgiven for your failures, to love God and others. God does, wants to deal with our failures. He relates to us on gra in grace. He's shown that in Christ and on the cross, to love God and others. That's just something of what life is, what is offered in Christ, and that we should tell people about that. Because it's great. It's good. Uh, moving on then. How does God bring this new life to people? He's personally intervened to do it. At great cost. He's, he's actually intervened on the human side to renew the human race and our connection with God. Because he's offered to God, God has offered to himself, if you like, from the human side, the offering and life we couldn't do. That at least is part of the atonement. And I think that's an amazing idea that Christ has, is, is, a, is humanity offering to God and God offering humanity to God. So it's an amazing thought. And Jesus also substituted for us in absorbing and dealing with the consequences of human sin in his death. That too is part of the message. It's mystery, but there it is. Now, in other words, in part of what we say there is Christ, in, in Christ... God has not stayed apart from the pain of human life, but has actually absorbed it in somehow and dealt with it. And then Christ has, Jesus has become the source of new life as the resurrected and living Lord. Okay, and the last part to mention, if I can get there. So what happens if you come back to God, to fa to God through faith in Jesus Christ? I, I did, dealt with a, I drew this up sometime, and I used to keep it in my Bible, in my you know, in my glove box and things. And I would say to them, "Would you like to know the difference if you actually do decide?" And they, I may not want to decide, okay? But if you want to, if you want to know what this life will be like before you sign up, uh, you know, here it is. Here's my seven, just seven, but they're pretty good, and they've got a nice biblical roundedness. Seven, um, you know, um, you will gain freedom from the power of sin that leads to death, through the forgiveness of your sin. God will set you free from your failures in his eyes. Forgive you and start and set you free. You'll receive, secondly, a new standing before God. You'll be clothed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Thirdly, you will have friendship with God, a real personal relationship with God, which will grow as the years go on. 
Fourthly, you'll be transformed progressively as God works through your life, in your life, through his Holy Spirit to change you into the person he wants you to be and it will be good. It will set you free. It will be a blessing. Fifthly, you will receive one blessing after another, one grace after another, as you experience God in your life, in answers to prayers, guidance from God. God will be with you in the, in the green pastures and the dark valleys of life. Sixthly, you will have the thrill and satisfaction of being a partner with God in God's mission to renew the world. God will bring you into the plan to help the world. Change you so you can change the world. And seventhly, you will live with God forever in an eternal life of joy in the presence of God and God's people. They're my seven. I've found when I've shared those with people, people have been interested in that. So that's a positive uh, exposition of what, God, what the new life in Christ is about. And the final point in the challenge, remember that how we live now is either moving us closer to God and eternal life or moving us further away to the habits of character and the choices we make. Remember to choose well and choose life. And the choices you make now are either making it easy for you to turn to God or actually making it harder. Anyway, there we go. So that's my little demo. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Thank you. We've just got a couple minutes if there's some questions, but I just want to start off by saying I'm so grateful. I mean, I, this has just been an amazing presentation. Okay. And my prayer is that God is preparing us for someone to have a conversation and take this thing that we believe as the sovereign word mm. and integrate it into a, a gospel presentation. So mm. I'm so grateful. Are there questions that uh, mm. we've left out? Happy to learn from everyone else here about how to do it. I don't know if it's a question so much as I just appreciate your emphasis of the doctrine of the resurrection. Yeah. Uh, First yep. Corinthians 15. Yep. Just to me is so real. Yep. And compelling. You know, that mm. uh, without the resurrection, we would be pity. That's right. Yeah. Uh, so I, I thank you for yeah. your faithful. Well, brother, that's real. I thank you because I think that's that is so important. That's something we've got to tell the world, and we ought to really put it in the center. Yep. I just want, I think one of the interesting shifts that happens in presenting the gospel is uh, now the, the the negative side of the gospel is no longer uh, eternal punishment, but the privation of eternal life. That's it. Yeah. Uh, however, mm-hmm. with that said, I wonder if there's still some where we have to answer the question of the day of wrath or yeah. the wrath. Or mm. the judgment that still happens. Like I, I, I don't want to drop that out entirely. Oh. Oh. Um, although shifting the focus away from that may be okay. I mean, we had a discussion this morning about how the mm. Apostle Paul in the book of Acts did not seem to mention hell quite mm. that much, mm. if at all. Mm. So I guess the question is, yeah. where does that fit in at all into this adjusted yeah. framework? Christopher Marshall, in the chapter that's in the book, we're thinking hell, talks about that. Even in the scriptures, judgment of God is seen to work out in the consequences of people's actions. But um, I, I, I don't think most people would, would uh, bridle at the idea that God has a right to actually call things to account. Most, most people uh, that I meet I get quite indignant when they see injustice that goes without being dealt with. You know, they, that, That's one of the things I say. If there is a God, why doesn't he deal with all these things? And so I found myself sometimes saying to people, well, you know, what you're, you are right. Your instinct is right. You really want to see these things being dealt with and held to account. And that's all the Bible is actually talking. Ultimately, these things will be held to account. Now, how that judgment operates, you know, what that means, you know, we don't have to make that the major thing. But, yeah, I think the point is a good one. We should probably uh, head to the next uh, seminar. And you just make sure to grab all of your stuff. And uh, thank you again, Ralph. That was I feel good. Thank you. That's good. <laughs>